Hello, everybody. What's going on? This is Ali Alexander. Welcome to Chicago Corner. So today uh, we're going to go over just kind of a random collection of videos. Um, this goes along with another video that I'll have coming out. I'm um, just kind of going over some small creators in Chicago, smaller content creators, um, and the work that they're doing. I'll kind of be doing a play on a, a lot of those videos in the coming weeks. But tonight, um, we're going to look at some videos that show a side of Chicago that you really don't see. Um, and a lot of this is not to exploit people. That's not my intention. My intention is just to show you guys, like, what's really going on. Uh, I love, you know, something I do love about YouTube is that you can find tons of videos just showing, like, the neighborhoods, um, parts of the city that you're not going to see on the news. Or, in this case, you are going to hear about them in a light where you don't you just hear like three men shot and like you don't hear anything else about them so my angle is to just kind of show more context about like what's going on in a lot of these neighborhoods and why things are the way they are um it's no judgment you know i've got friends that have lived in different neighborhoods in chicago that have gotten out and they've been lucky to get out um i love the city and i think that in order for it to really fundamentally change you have to really address the root of the problem and a big contributor to the problems in Chicago are the work of the government. Um, unfortunately, the local government, or the, rather the failure of it. So let's just look at some different channels. I'm going to share my screen. Um, there's a channel and it's called Charlie Bow. He, he's, uh, his name is Charlie, I presume. I'm actually going to get in touch with him and see if he'll come on the show because he drives around some of the you know, most impoverished neighborhoods in the cities across America, but he's done a lot of work in Chicago. And it's really great work because he talks to people that live there. And that's what I'm all about, just talking to people. So I'm gonna show you guys some of his content tonight and just kind of talk over it and see what what you think. Uh, let me see here, just give me one moment. Actually, I'm lying. So what we're gonna look at first is a documentary that I've also talked to the creators of, and um, I wanna see if I can get them on the show. It's called Where Did Chicago Go Wrong? So we're gonna look at a little bit of that because that's actually gonna give you more context about how Chicago got to be one of the most segregated, if not the most segregated city in the country. And it's wild to me that people still don't really get it that live here. Um, I mean, you can choose to not see it, but it's becoming hard, harder and harder to ignore um, what decades of machine politics have done to this city so let's look at that oopsies one sec i'm still learning guys there we go cool okay very good very good yeah so where does chicago go wrong america's hyper segregated city This is Cabrini Green. Actually, sorry, let me back it up a little bit. My bad. All right. I'm gonna do this actually. in the shadows of its famous skyline. Closing an era shrouded in an ambiguous past. One that if not remembered, will soon be forgotten. This story's legacy, the violence and poverty that plagued Chicago's hyper-segregated communities. But what is known about the systems that created them? The laws that isolated them? and the policies that abandoned them. And how does a city heal from decades of heartbreaking loss? At the crossroad of a nation, this is Chicago's story. I just want to say that um, oh. really, really quick, I just want to say that uh, 4,000, let me double check the number here, 4,174 people were shot in 2020 in Chicago. Like, 
it's such a huge number that I think people have a hard time wrapping their head around it, but that's 400, uh, sorry, 4,174 4, people, 792 murdered. And, you know, I'll show you guys maybe a little later, one of Lori Lightfoot's infamous PSAs that she does and says things are fine and she doesn't address this ever. And there's a million reasons why things are the way they are. And I'm, again, I'm not passing judgment. Um, it's just, we're all Chicagoans. I want, I want people to care more about other neighborhoods than just their own, especially in places like where I live, where things are better. Like, I just have a real problem and a hard time. And I've always had this problem, a hard time wrapping my head around it. The last, you know, 13, 14 years I've lived here. Um, why is it that a little girl can walk outside where I'm at and walk to the park, but seven miles south, there's a good chance that she might get hit by a stray bullet. And that's not being dramatic. Um, you know, I'm not going to just rest easy when I know that there's people in this city who are my fellow Chicagoans um, that have to worry about a bullet coming through their front window every night. Like that, you listen to, you know, citizen calls into like a, a police board in Chicago and they'll talk about how they need more police help. You know, think what you will of the police. You know, it's not my thoughts, but they are needed at some places to at least like help people. You, you get what I'm saying. Um, you know, they need more resources there. They're not being used properly. Um, and that, that's a whole other bag of worms I'm not going to get into, or can of worms. Um, I'm not going to get into it. But what I'm saying is that some people are living in a literal war zone. They have been. This isn't new. But I think it's good to just touch on this. And again, I'm not, you know, trying to exploit anyone who lives or came up in any of these neighborhoods, I've been to them. Like it just, it is what it is, but I don't understand how people can keep voting for the same type of politicians, you know, expecting them to deal with the deal with it. Like this is a consequence of horrible, horrible city planning and leadership. So that's Cabrini, Cabrini, yes. Or wait, that was Robert Taylor. Let's, let's see. 72 murders for the month. For three days, 68 people were shot. What the hell is going on in Chicago? That's more people shot in one no, weekend this than an were in a typical video. month. In Remember, this is just one perspective. Putting Chicago on pace for 700 shots the city live so on Facebook segregated. last night. Deadly gun violence is surging in Chicago once again. After a horrific weekend in Chicago, more needs to be done. More than 3,000 people have been shot in Chicago. Homicide is related to the desperation of young men, and particularly black young men in the United States. And that's what we're seeing in Chicago. When people think of PTSD as being what happens to people who've been in combat, the choices are very limited. But I got to lose my life. For real. And like you right see these neighborhoods, the I'll show you later. Like the tale of two cities. Mm hmm. If you are downtown Chicago, you almost feel untouchable. Then you go south. Go west. You go out to some of the neighborhoods, they just are starved for resources and investment. This isn't unique only to Chicago, but it's just very apparent if you know where to look. That's abandonment. That's a systematic destruction. Mm-hmm. And I'll talk about TIF fund or TIF money later and how that's used. I know Kit and Daniel have talked about it it's before that, that, on this channel. Stuff can start spilling out, but we could turn the fire down. We have people, they present the problem. And they say, yo, this is the problem, this is the problem, this is the problem. Okay, you're woke. You know the problem. What is the solution? Right. I don't have it. I don't have all the answers, but shit. I think the people, you know, living in the neighborhoods should have some say in what happens in their goddamn neighborhoods. Oh man, I remember this night. I was at Grant Park when this happened. It was wild. It's been over a decade 
since the world's eyes were unmistakably fixed on Grant Park in Chicago. The night the nation elected its first African-American president, Barack Obama. The pride of a city- One sec, one sec. Have been greater. Chicago felt together in unison mm -hmm. with a renewed optimism a for the future. Night. Especially me. I grew up right around Argyle Gardens, one of Chicago's most desolate public housing projects, home to toxic landfills and the abandoned industrial plants, the gardens, where Barack Obama began his career as a community organizer. When I was a kid, you couldn't have felt further from the luxury of the Chicago Loop growing up. I was one of the lucky ones who made it out, overcoming the odds to become a spoken word artist and a Grammy winning producer. I grew up seeing the bloodshed of the gang wars in the 90s. And it was at this moment. America is a place where all things are possible. Change has come to America. Fell for that shit that I thought we had reached a new day for America, for Chicago. But the feeling didn't seem to last forever. By the end of President Obama's second term, the world's eyes were once again focused on Chicago. This time, for all the wrong reasons. Murder was running through Chicago faster than the Chicagoans running from it. Blood was flowing through our streets. What went so wrong in this city? to make it the case study for murder and violence. Right. Or is Chicago just a scapegoat for a violent nation and a testament for things to come? <clears throat> Truth be told, Chicago ranks just ninth in murders per capita. I don't know if that's and 24th accurate. 24th in now, violent crimes. That might be different but in the now, court of public opinion, made. Chicago is an active war zone. Even as Shoot mass camera. shootings multiply and urban violence okay. escalates coast to coast, but for Chicagoans, we oh. recognize the issue. We know it's up to us to fix it because no one else will. There's so many activist groups that work their ass uh, off Monday, we for were years. Told we were the deadliest month of August, deadliest month of 20 years. On Tuesday, we were told Chicago has more murders. Ooh, New York things Los are not Angeles good for Michael Flager together. right now. I'm pretty sure he's being prosecuted. I saw pictures of people have been killed. Actually. One is my son. Right there with the red cap on. Yeah, he's yeah. going to return to my son. Stream, uh, while years. he is being investigated it has for happened again. sexual abuse. This latest victim, uh, a six-year-old girl. Tonight we're learning more about a six-year-old girl who was shot while playing outside on this hot summer day. That's so common. Weekend blood. I just really want us to live in peace. Sometimes the only way people can cope is just to try not to cope, not even to deal with it, ignore it like it's not happening. Yeah, like I can't pretend like I know what this is like. Right? When a six-year-old girl from my okay, school I hate that it's says Michael to me, talking. Father Mike, we pray for me. Ugh. I told him I'm going to pray for her. She said that I'm He's alive. He straight up is something. being accused of a lot of bad shit with kids, so. That a child has to even think like that at six? They deserve their future. But yeah, I mean, this they PTSD right from up. the day you're born. Yeah, going back like, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to look at like other neighborhoods. It's like um, the different. We're all human. I just want more people to know about it. He's gonna be a police officer and a doctor, huh? Yep. You gonna yep. be making people feel good and taking the crime off the streets at the same time. That's what I'm talking about, my baby. What's our phrase? What you want people to do? What you want these men to do outside? Put the guns down. Put the guns down. We gonna fight, gonna shoot, cry. and kill over blocks that have been abandoned and neglected. Some blocks that look like third world countries, and we're gonna fight over a block that other people don't give a damn about. How stupid is that? Instead of banding together and said we're gonna be in the real fight and bring some economic development, bring some jobs. Yeah, but the alder would never do because it pays. It pays to have divided areas. Give me a way out. Give me an opportunity. This fight is in our hands. 
how did it end up like this? So violent. I don't even want to make this about race, but it's just so the way the city so was many. designed. It's just so happens that find the it is mostly African American communities. We have to go and back. Some, there's violence in some Hispanic back communities in Chicago, but you'll you'll understand more as this channel progresses. What I mean. Most of the adults were born in rural areas of the South. They came to Chicago looking for a better way of life. They came to the south side of the city because they found that this was a place where Negroes were permitted to live. About all that they brought with them were their hopes and their dreams. They knew if they could make it to Chicago from Mississippi, from Alabama, from Arkansas, there was work here. Chicago was a gold mine if you lived in the South. Chicago was the place where people came so they could build their families and build their futures. And you began to work at the steel mill. People worked at the stockyard. You could be an accountant in the North. You could work for an insurance company in the North. You could be a policeman in the North. There was harmony cohesiveness and happiness because people fled the South were looking to the future. There was finally a light at the end of the tunnel for Southern Blacks and a chance to live the American dream of the North. But that light would prove to be nothing more than a mirage. Sometimes we talk about this era as if it was all wonderful. Segregation was part of the culture of the North. The hope I really had when I come here to do better. But after I got you and started away, it looked like to me I did worse. This is when the city of Chicago, with help from the private industry, real estate, and banks, decided, well, we don't want Black people living with white people. And that began a host of policies that I call the Jim Crow North. The agreement was called Restrictive Covenants. Black people come from the South, they definitely can't live with us. So where do we live? Pushed to the worst neighborhoods. We're pushed to slums that others have moved out from. Racism is structured into housing. That is, when people who are from a different background move in large numbers, you just restrict them to certain areas. We were assigned where to live. On the one hand, it was the joy of our living together, free of the burdens of the South. But then we were trapped and could not grow, could not get out. The concentration of people was four times that of adjacent white communities. The Black Belt, and gradually, block by block by block. The Black Belt just kept bursting by the seams because Black people couldn't live anywhere else. People like know the Chicago history, but they really don't. Chicago really notorious at this time for being a difficult place for African Americans to come and find good, fair housing at decent prices. I was there and I saw what can happen to human beings if they're excluded from the main source of opportunity. And again, this is why I'm like, yeah, sure, the government should it help, but can they worse, manage well, it properly? If it did, I wouldn't be living at all. And this is all thanks to Richard uh, Daly, the first mayor. Well, I don't mean the first mayor of Chicago, but the first Daly. Chicago is one of the most segregated cities on earth. You're segregated by class as well as race. And so it's almost tribal. Yeah. I find that people of all races seem to think that this is something that just naturally happened. Oh, well, I just live around people who are like me. It's like in part. I grew up in an all black community. The only time I ever saw anybody that wasn't black is when I went to go buy food. I had to buy that from the Arabs. If I was being detained by the police, a lot of no, times I mean, it in some been, ways, uh, it's, white it's officers, gotten but just random white people in the hood, they would never no, do that. You feel like, man, it has to be city. some sort of 
plan or something. It doesn't mean that people that are you know, inherently like racist towards each other, you know, discriminatory to towards each other. It's just Most the people system on the north in the side. city itself. The reason they don't know anything laid about out. the south side is because they've never been to the south side. For sure. Ever. I have friends that have never been. Ever. It's wild. So it's easy to say, I don't worry about that. That's not in my backyard. You see what's happening on the news. Yep. Boy shot, girl shot, kid shot on a playground. And you say to yourself, I have no idea what's going on. To truly understand the plight of Chicago into the city that you see today, we have to go back a bit to the city fathers who saw the blighted slums as eyesores instead of communities and its residents as second-class citizens. Fixing the problem while maintaining segregation would prove to be the point of no return. Today, the endless plain is gone. We must build a new city on top of the old. Today, we have and have to have a comprehensive plan for the city of Chicago. Sounds like Taking something I just heard the other day. Of all the people to have a decent place to live. Public housing starts in the New Deal as a response to the poverty conditions and also slum conditions that existed in many cities. The idea was to clear the slums, build new housing, and this will make better citizens. And this is the kind of government flow of money from Washington that Mayor Richard J. Daley was very interested in bringing to Chicago. This project see where it starts. represents the future of a great city. How are we going to do this? Well, it's cheaper to build up. We're going to build up. We build high rises. The federal government said it's high rises or yet nothing. Everyone took the high rise across the country. The sun. For most of us who are living in ghettos and moving into the projects was a chance to get stabilized and then to move into the mainstream of American housing, American life. When folks first moved in public housing, it was the place to be. African-Americans will tell you that, veterans will tell you that. When we talk about the 50s, 60s, and the 70s. I think the buildings are nice, but it's just like taking one big slum and sit it in another slum because nothing had been changed. So, yeah, let's try that again. You wanted it simpler. Um, public housing failed in Chicago for a few very basic reasons. They went up in waves across the country. Partnerships between Washington and local housing authorities. The government would pay to build public housing and a local entity would manage the day-to-day -day operations and plan the construction. Public In this case, the Chicago Housing Authority, CHA. Chicago's plan was more ambitious than any in the country. A total of 29 public housing communities would grow up across Chicago in just a few decades. A mix of row houses, mid-rises, and high-rise buildings were scattered and then there were the monsters. Cabrini Green on the city's north side, concentrating more than 15,000. Whoa. If Cabrini Green was the monster, well, then Robert Taylor was the Goliath. 28 16-story buildings located directly on the raised south side slums one of a cluster of housing projects that span nearly four miles as far as the eye could see. So those are five different public housing developments in this one corridor concentrated in the heart of the south side of Chicago. That many buildings with that many poor people in one place, it decimated the south side of Chicago. The city planners have come too far to turn back now. The decisions to maintain segregation in Chicago would come at a price because there were massive holes in their master plan. But nobody said segregation would be easy, beginning with the basic function of paying for the absorbent upkeep of the buildings themselves. The income to maintain the massive structures relied mostly on a scaled portion of tenant wages, and the bottom would soon fall out of urban industrialization and the funds to operate public housing, much like the jobs that had lured millions from the South, 
and all disappear too. Goodness, bro. I'm 33 years old. I've been over 33 years. The heating systems, it's not working. Girl, it's, this don't make no sense. I like actually at least it has some heat. Y'all seen the floods in the building, the water, the pipes, them busted, and everything like that. When I moved into public housing, there was rigorous background checks. There were social workers who checked in on you. They no longer did any of that. They simply took people, threw them in. They said, if you want to live in public housing, come on, go in. The quality of life was hell, hell on earth. You might go to sleep and it might be... You may get on the elevator and the elevator smell like urine. You may be outside playing basketball, hooping, and somebody that you just pass the ball to might get shot in the head. I lost a good friend of mine. He was out just shooting jumpers, and they came through and shot him 19 times, automatic. The police My always used to say they don't go into like the brain until the shooting stops. You hear a lot of residents PTSD say they fear for their life because of so lack of protection. The Planners made a choice to build housing for large families, families with five, six, seven children. Originally, there were seven persons to every unit. When you couple that with female-headed families and average incomes of $5,000, they didn't think about how many kids they were putting in a building versus the number of adults. People who were concerned about their children playing were up 16 floors while their children were 16 floors away. All of a sudden, the children are now creating their own rules for living without the connection to their mothers, their fathers, their uncles, their grandparents. If you could imagine a 16-story building pouring out children and then the children deciding what they wanted to do, what was good, whether or not they wanted to fight, whether or not they wanted to steal. You have to put all of this shift in public housing at the feet of public policy. The government would not pay for a child who had a father living with that child. Fathers of some children this in this building yeah. found their families could be helped by the welfare so department. Up but only if they left home It's something or that's died. become controversial to talk about, but it's Father leaves, directly related to the what drops. happened in history. Hey, that's a pretty good deal. It became a financial incentive for the father to move out. My I'm not saying this is, you know, the and only we reason, had those but... come to our homes to find out if there were men's clothes or if we had a new television. Hey, Jane, this is Mr. Uh, Stewart. Glad to meet you, Mr. Stewart. How are you? I'm here to help you find a place to move. What would happen then is that you've got a lot of children now without adult supervision from men. And the dropout rate in the schools began to increase dramatically. Many of the boys were put out of school and they were in the streets and they terrorized the community, this community and others. For one reason or another. Across America, public housing is in ruins, called a national disgrace. Cabrini Green, to some folks, it has become a hell on earth. Life and Robert Taylor is Cops dominated by there. welfare, women, and children. Either CHA but it was a community. Is going to manage just got rid of it. It's real estate. Or we should just declare openly that the gangs have control of our property. And, uh, and let them have it. And your reasons it's for like, joining a gang like you suffer too. Movie. You mean, Especially back then compared to right now, now. The times the of like Larry Hoover and David Barksdale. Uh, the gang and the drug dealer. 
Everyone and now it's so on different because all the factions have split even further. I can't wait to see you guys, like, for you guys soon and be very young. And I'm not making judgments about this shit, by the way. I would like to see some jobs come to us where we all can make money, get off aid, and just live like we want to live. Because, see, right now we all struggling. I'm struggling for money, food, and everything else. Five years from now? <laughs> I'm tell you, I don't really know. I hope to still be living. Reports from Chicago, where the U.S. government has just seized control of the local public housing authority. Today's takeover in Chicago makes the federal government landlord of America's poorest, most crime-infested public housing projects. Like, they just blame it on the people that in live the there. In the end, like, these high-rise public housing developments were awful places to live. I remember driving measure, past those when I was little with my parents and always just wondering what those massive towers were. Like any other slum building in the city. By the late 1990s, everybody realized this had been a mistake. In big cities across America, the consensus is public housing doesn't work. And in Chicago, it's coming down. Chicago will destroy more public housing than any city in the country. The debate over what should replace them and who should live there has been fierce. Can the people here of any agency of their own? Maybe like, the thing that was most detrimental to this city was the federal government and the Chicago Housing Authority pouring folks out that they didn't prepare, that they had for generations. Hundreds of gunshots are reported, more than a dozen killings in one weekend. Many of the victims are teenagers. New gang wars are breaking out in Chicago, and as wars. the homicide rate is at a near record high. They don't tell you why there's gang wars. The Chicago way, Housing course. Authority developments has reached a new high in Chicago. That would be, they would have to tell you about stuff that they've already known. An upsurge in violence and a debate over how to combat it by the Secretary of Housing to Chicago. After a night in Robert Taylor Holmes, he called mm. conditions deplorable. American women and children are living in a setting just as a side note, which I'll cover this more in time, um, I'll talk more about Larry Hoover. So he was, um, he is, he's still alive. Um, and David Barksdale got together. And then um, just, there was a child that was shot. And there was like gang wars going on. And um, the Fed, I believe, I don't think it was just the Chicago police. Um, the feds actually ended up picking a lot of these people off the street. So uh, yeah, Larry Hoover founded um, Gangster Disciples. So actually he's serving six life sentences right now. And he's, um, he was trying to actually use recent law legislation um, changes. I believe it actually was under Trump. It was like the first step act. I think he was trying to use that to get out because there's really interesting st uh, story behind um, Larry Hoover and David Barksdale um, and how they actually brought gangs together and they really just modeled like a corporation. That's how they operated. Um, pretty much, you know, Lee Hoover like renounced his criminal past and he really was trying to like bring people together and show them a different way. So he was like, you know, saying that like GD instead of gangster disciples actually was changed to mean growth and development. Um, and it says a lengthy federal investigation using wiretaps led Hoover uh, getting another life sentence in 1995. Uh, prosecutors alleged that Hoover's gang had 30,000 soldiers in 35 states and made $100 million a year, um, $3,300 per soldier annually. So he was indicted for drug conspiracy, extortion, continuing to engage in criminal enterprise. But honestly, he, I think, yeah, Kanye even, like, pled for him to get clemency. So, you know, did he run some criminal things? Sure, but why did he do it? And he was just trying to play along with what which white men were doing too. So there's, you know, he brought a sense of like family and community after a lot of nefarious actions. Um, and I'll get into more of this later because there's a couple of people I want to bring on who who know him slash have worked with him. So I don't want to say too much. And again, I'm not like advocating for you know, gang violence, but there was a lot more to this story than what meets the eye and what you'll hear on the news and probably even what you'll hear on this documentary that is violent, and demeaning, and fearsome, 
and introduces their children to a world without hope. What those conditions meant, said the mayor, is that public housing in Chicago has failed. The bottom line is that high-rise public housing does not work. Isolating, as pointed out, low-income people, entire uh, 20 story mayor before before Ron Daly. has failed. So CHA Chairman Vince Lane pressed this narrows for a loan of $1 billion to do what Lane says may be the only thing left to do. Total change public housing as we now know it. There's a failure of the city, a failure of the housing authority, a failure of the federal government in Washington to allow conditions to spiral down to that level. Once you withdrew maintenance, it was only a matter of time. For years, community activists at Cabrini Green have been saying the city's ultimate plan was to move them out of these buildings and off this land because Cabrini is only minutes from downtown Chicago, making is, the land very it valuable. It's prime real estate. Public they have built some shit there that's nice housing, but that's so amazing. In the There's empty. The most valuable land. Do CHA residents really want to move? And so the people who live in public housing said, we just want to stay here. It's the American dream, a little house in the suburbs with a picket fence. Uh, look, uh, the American dream for me is to be left alone. Right? If you could live Amen anywhere you want that. to, where would you Amen live? Amen to that. I still here. I've been raised up over all my life. Why? I'm comfortable over here. We just prepared for the worst right now. Okay. Oh, just leave me alone. Leave them alone. Let people live, man. And it went down fast. Cities had erased <laughs> high rise public housing from their city plan. The entire area will be transformed into a middle class, white, yuppie style community. That's what is happening. That land is worth a billion dollars if it's cleared. There's a conspiracy theory that what's really going to happen is that everyone's going to be squeezed out. They will make way for the big buck developers. Is that going to happen? It's literally no, what happened. No, it won't happen. And I'm committed to make sure that public housing residents are not displaced from their communities. Yeah, well. It's very difficult to maintain peace and tranquility in the midst of confusion. If we leave here, where are we going to go? If we leave here, where are we going to live? There were 30,000 families living in public housing. Where were people going to go? Was there going to be a revolt? Could this be pulled off? My primary concern is where's the next generation going to live? You think they're thinking about the American dream? What 